All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for bearing with us. Um, okay, we have Spanish interpretation set up. We also have ASL interpretation live. So if you do want um, direct ASL interpretation, could you please message us in the chat and we will make sure that we give you the power to pin so that you can see the interpreter, but the interpreter also should be spotlit. So um, let us know in the chat if you need anything regarding um, uh, interpretation in ASL or Spanish. So thank you so much for hanging in there with us. We are gonna go ahead and get started. Um, for this webinar today, um, we're gonna be talking about um, sheltering animals and families together. And just wanna let you all know that we will have time at the end for questions. So if you would like to type questions in the chat as we go along, feel free to do that. Make sure you select um, everyone from the drop down menu so that everyone can see your question. Um, and just know that our presenter, Allie Phillips, um, will answer questions at the end, but you can type them in the chat at any point in time and I'll keep an eye on those. So mm -hmm. I am gonna go ahead and turn it over to Allie. Thank you so much, Allie, for being here. And Allie is the founder and CEO of Sheltering Animals and Families Together, Safety. And she's gonna give us some awesome information about sheltering pets. Thank you, Allie. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Brandy, uh, for having me here. And I'm gonna go through a lot of information. Um, so hopefully this is gonna be very helpful to you. Um, but I am the founder and CEO of Sheltering Animals and Families Together, which is a global nonprofit working with domestic violence shelters to create on-site pet housing. So I come to this uh, as a former prosecuting attorney. I have spent 28 years as an attorney in the field of criminal prosecution. And a majority of that time, I have also been teaching. So I uh, speak at conferences, I give presentations, I do a lot of writing and uh, publications in this particular area. And my criminal prosecution specialty is how animal abuse links to family violence. So this, you know, is something that I've been very passionate about for, oh gosh, I, I don't even know when I came up with this concept. It was probably back in 1996, um, but I will, I will go through that in a little bit. But that's just a little bit about me and how I come to you today. So I am gonna talk about uh, on-site pet housing at domestic violence shelters. I'm not gonna talk about off-site. That is its own separate topic. That is a whole separate webinar because um, that has a lot of parts and pieces to it. Um, but this particular program that I created recognizes that animal abuse links in with domestic violence, child abuse, and elder abuse. So it, it's actually a solution to what we call the link, where uh, animal abuse is linking to other crimes. And um, if, if, you, if you can see me on the camera, this is Rudy behind me. So he's, he's always in Zoom meetings. So he's here as my uh, chief feline officer. So he, <laughs> he monitors my work. <laughs> so anyway, um, I'm not going to show any abusive photos. Don't worry about that. I'm just going to uh, show you what the shelters are doing. But I want to give you a little bit of a background on why this is increasingly becoming more popular. And it's because pets are part of the family. And these numbers keep going up every year. You know, two years ago, it was 68% of American homes have a pet. Now we're at 70%. So, you know, when we look at pets, they really are part of the family. I mean, look at Rudy here, he's participating with, with all of us in this webinar. And, you know, about 67% of homes with kids under the age of six have a pet. And when we look at women, women are the primary caretaker of pets in homes, about 72%. So, you know, we, we bring them in, these are four-legged children to many people, and they can get caught in the crossfire of family violence. 
And so just very briefly, because I do, I do a 90 minute presentation on the link between animal abuse and family violence. So I'm literally going to do 90 seconds <laughs> here just to lay the foundation that um, we literally have hundreds and hundreds of studies from all over the world validating what instinctively we know that when there is violence in a home, no one is safe. Not two-legged children, not four-legged children, not the adults, not the elders, no one is safe. And shelter women are nearly 11 times more likely to report that their partner had hurt or killed their pet and four times higher to report that their pet was threatened. And you know, when we look at those who are in the line of violence, they are more likely to stay behind because they don't know what to do with their pets. So they're either staying in the abusive home or they are encountering homelessness because they don't wanna be separated from their pets. And when we look at children in the home, when there is violence, they are eight times more likely to become a violent offender from witnessing animal abuse. It is one of the biggest triggers to a child growing up and becoming violent. And when we look at the research studies, we find that survivors want to be asked about pets at intake. You know, they, they feel uh, very powerless in their decision about whether they leave without their pet, do they leave their pet behind, and they want safe options. They want shelters to help them in this. And so when I look at the annual numbers uh, that NNEDV gives us every year, um, and they've probably just done their 2022 um, uh, census, but this is the census from last year. So in looking at a little over 1900 shelters in the US in a 24 hour time period, over 70,000 victims received services. Um, a little over half of those actually found safe housing. But 9,444 had unmet needs, 64% of those related to housing. How many of those were pet related? That's what we don't know. So I'm in discussions with them, <laughs> um, but that's the thing, we don't know. And I would suspect that a lot of that is pet related because 70% of homes have a pet. So when I look at that, that there are on average 10 million men and women who are victims of interpersonal violence every year. And over 600,000 children are maltreated every year. You then put those numbers into 70% of American homes have a pet. Oh my goodness, that number is high. I mean, that, that could be about 7 million domestic violence victims needing to find safe housing with their pets. That's a lot. That is a huge number. And, you know, we, we don't know if they have one pet or 20 pets. So this is a growing problem. The more that pets really come into homes, become acclimated and become family members. And the reason that this is happening is pets are very important. Uh, they're especially important for anybody who is experiencing violence in the home because they provide support and comfort and security. They lower blood pressure, they lower our heart rate, they lower stress and anxiety and depression. They give us greater satisfaction in life. But what they really, really help with, especially for those who are leaving a violent home, is they help with loss and grief because they, they provide such unconditional love that when you have truly lost everything and you're trying to start a new life, you're gonna go through the loss and grief process and pets can really help with that. But you know, when we start looking at shelters, you know, the last study that we had, this was 10 years ago, less than half of the shelters were asking about pets. I think that number is significantly higher now, but yet we don't know, we haven't had a recent survey. So you know, I, I work with shelters to help them understand that the batterers who abuse pets are are some of the most dangerous people uh, that you can encounter because they're engaging in more dangerous forms of violence, such as sexual violence, marital rape, emotional violence, and stalking. So we need to pull the family out. We need to get them to safety. And when, when I look at the numbers that upwards of 65% 
delay moving because they don't know what to do with their pets, that is an unacceptable number to me. And this is why a, a very, very long time ago when I was a prosecutor, I came up with this entire concept and have formalized it so that I can help shelters. And so this really is the solution. So I, I came up with the, um, with the concept around 1996 and 1997 when I was actually working as a criminal prosecutor. But I didn't launch the first set of written guidelines until 2008. I had been teaching about it. I had been speaking at conferences about it. But the first guidelines came out in 2008. And so the safety program is the first and it's still the only global initiative working around the world with domestic violence shelters to bring on-site pet housing into the norm. And so as a domestic violence shelter, you can go to the safety program website and request a free download of this manual. Okay, it's, it's got everything in it you need to know. And so I'm gonna go through it very briefly uh, just to give you an idea. Um, but this is where we're at. And I love this because all the green, those are the states that have at least one safety shelter. You know, all we're really missing right now in the U.S. is D.C., Delaware, Hawaii, Nebraska, and Rhode Island. Um, and this is a program that is now in five countries because it's in Australia, Canada, Netherlands, and Spain. So it is growing, and um, I, I have been working extensively um, with Scotland um, to get the first shelter in the U.K., uh, that is a long going partnership uh, working with that. And I've been doing a lot of work with Saskatchewan, uh, which is the province in Canada that has the highest rates of domestic violence. So this is not just a US you know, concept, a US um, program, it is worldwide because unfortunately domestic violence is worldwide. And so I created this um, when I was a frontline prosecutor because I had too many cases where you know, my complaining victim went home in order to take care of the family pet. And I just felt that that was, I, I just, I couldn't fathom that. And I didn't understand at that time why shelters were not welcoming pets. It's just like going on vacation with your dog. You find a pet friendly hotel. And so, I mean, this idea just literally came to me in one moment. And, you know, that was back in 1996 and 97. And I have been talking about it ever since and growing this to almost 300 shelters worldwide. And the foundation of this program is recognizing the human animal bond, that that bond is important in times of stress because pets help us with healing, with recovery, with resiliency. And when we look at kids, kids and pets go together. It is a natural biological bond that we are born with. And it also helps children with more compassion and empathy. But this program is also about reducing a barrier to safety because with 70% of homes having a pet, if your shelter is unwilling or unable to welcome pets on site, you're not able to help 70% of your community. So, you know, offsite options can be unpredictable and unavailable. Because if you're relying on foster homes or space at an animal shelter or veterinary clinic, what do you do if that space isn't available? This is where domestic violence shelter can literally empower themselves by bringing this program in-house so that you are responsible for it, you are in control of it. And what it is, is it's a solution to these link-related crimes where animal abuse is linking in with domestic violence and child abuse. And so a question, you know, I get a lot of questions from citizens because I speak to a lot of, you know, Kiwanis and Rotary groups and they want to know why aren't shelters taking pets? It just seems like a no brainer. Well, there are concerns about allergies and there's concerns about how, how you're going to fund this. How do you get it going? How do you sustain it? What do you do about dog bites? What do you do if, if a survivor leaves and abandons their pet with you? You know, you're not an animal shelter. What do you do? What if the abuser demands ownership of the pet and all of a sudden you have a pet custody battle happening? I address all of this in the safety startup manual. All of these issues are addressed. 
So let me go through just briefly and kind of give you an idea of what's in the manual. So there are four steps to implementing the safety program. We start with before you make a decision to do this, what are the things that you need to think about? Then once you make the decision that you want to become a pet friendly shelter, what, is, what are the initial things you need to do before you implement? Then how do you get financially prepared? And then how do you welcome your first pet? So let's just touch on these really briefly. But first I wanna to touch on service and emotional support animals. So I, this is probably one of the biggest questions that I get, and there's a lot of confusion between what is a service animal, what is an assistance animal, what is an emotional support animal, and what is a family pet? They're all different. They all have different rights associated with them. But under the ADA, service dogs, which also includes miniature horses, um, are allowed entry into public buildings and public access areas, okay? So for shelters, this is really important to know that if, if you get a call and someone has a leader dog for the blind, okay, they're allowed entry. Now, the ADA does not cover emotional support animals. This is where there's a lot of confusion. But under uh, HUD, public housing and assistance housing programs cannot deny an assistance animal or an emotional support animal that serves a disability. So, you know, does the person have a disability, whether it's physical or mental impairment that limits one or more major life activities? And does the person have this need for an assistance or an emotional support animal? If yes, and if you're getting public housing or assisted housing funds through HUD, then the animal comes in. So I like to start here because all shelters, to my knowledge, have to comply with this, especially with the ADA. So if you have to take in a leader dog for the blind or a dog that helps to recognize if somebody's having a seizure, then you're ready to take a family pet because you're already having to make accommodations. So, so I talk about that in the safety manual. And then I, I always welcome discussions with shelters. You know, when you get the safety manual, if you still have questions, email me. We'll, we'll get on the phone, we'll get on Zoom. I'll answer all your questions and concerns. I love making shelter visits. Um, I just made a shelter visit. Um, I'm in Michigan and I made a, a visit to the Upper Peninsula last month. I love doing walkthroughs. So a walkthrough may require photos and videos if I'm not nearby but reach out, ask for help. And the one thing that I always recommend as you're in this decision-making phase, ask your shelter hotline workers to start asking about pets if they're already not doing that. So when there is a call in, ask that caller, do you have pets? How many pets do you have? Tell me if the pets are safe. Are you able to house them with friends or family? Have you delayed getting to safety? And then you got to prep your hotline workers with resources. So you can certainly just give them the safety program URL because I have a listing of shelters so that you can actually refer people to those shelters. And there's also another link on there where you can look for offsite housing. But when you start asking questions, you'll get an idea of, of what the need is in your community. And then that'll help you go out and ask for money to support this program. But it's always important to consult with your staff and garner support with your board of directors, your community leaders, you know, anybody who is supporting your shelter. People love animals and they love this program. And so I have found that funding is never a problem for this program. And I will get into that shortly. And then when we go to the initial implementation phase, you've decided that you're going to do this. It's a great thing for your community and you're going to find a way to make it work. First, figure out what type of pets you want to accept. Some shelters only take cats and dogs, maybe small pets like a rabbit, a gerbil, a hamster. Are you equipped to take farm animals? You know, I, I have been all over Colorado. I used to work for the American Humane Association that was, um, uh, that was in Inglewood. And so I was in Colorado a lot. I know you all have rural and farmland. So 
are you equipped to take a horse or a pot-bellied pig or a goat? So it's just figuring out what are you able to take now? And that's a good start. And then you got to figure out which housing option you want. And I'm actually going to show you photos of these. So housing option number one is where you put the pets in the room, just like you're going on vacation with your dog and you're finding a pet friendly hotel or pet friendly Airbnb. Housing option number two is where you create a separate room, a kennel within the shelter so that no one is actually leaving the, you know, your shelter to go see their pet. They literally stay inside and just go to another room. Housing option number three is where you house the pets in an outdoor setting. So maybe you have to go into a backyard to, to see a pet. And then housing option number four, if you have a transitional housing program, it is really important that pets be allowed because if there is ever a break in the chain of safety, your client is very likely to go back home or experience homelessness in order to be with their pet. So I'm gonna go into a little more detail uh, in these in just a little bit. But there are four policies that are you know, really, really important for a successful safety program. The first is to have a memorandum of understanding with an animal shelter or an animal rescue group. Because what do you do if you have space for five animals, but you receive a call and somebody has 12 cats? What do you do? This is where your animal partner is there as backup for excess pets, for noisy pets that just don't settle down at your shelter, for any large or exotic animals, you know, if they have a horse or they have, you know, a eight foot long snake and you're just not comfortable having a snake in your shelter, or to help you with a determination of whether a pet is aggressive or just stressed. So it's never, this program is never asking you to be an animal expert. It's asking you to just open the doors and then work with the animal experts. Second, also partnering with a veterinarian because some of these animals come in with abusive wounds. So they need surgery. Uh, they need, you know, they need veterinary medical care. So having that sort of partner can help you help these families with some even basic veterinary care. Many pets of domestic violence have never seen a veterinarian because that, that is one of the control features is depriving pets of veterinary care. So they just may need some basic shots, maybe a spay or a neuter surgery. They need some flea treatment. And when you partner with a veterinarian, I am finding that a lot of veterinarians offer their services at no cost or very, very low cost. So um, veterinarians really love this program and they wanna help. You just have to ask. The third recommendation is to partner with an agency that helps those experiencing homelessness because the percentage of domestic violence survivors in homelessness situations is way too high because they have pets. So when you partner with them, you may be able to identify people that you aren't aware of that could actually use your services. And then one of the most important options is that the family cares for the pets. It is not for you to become a pet caretaker at all. When the family takes care of the pet, it virtually eliminates any liability for a bite or a scratch because they are walking the dog, they are cleaning the litter box, they are the one interacting with their pet. And it's a, it's a way of maintaining normalcy in a situation that isn't normal for them. So, you know, if they're taking a dog in and out, um, people are not touching the dog. That is not safe. The dog may look friendly, the dog may look nice, but it depends on who is approaching them. So no one in the shelter comes into contact with these animals except designated shelter staff. And that virtually eliminates any liability, okay? So that is a really, really important concept. And then in the manual, I go through all the concerns that you can possibly come up with from, you know, what do we do if, if a dog comes in that is behaving aggressive? Um, what do we do if we have breed restrictions in our community? Um, what about allergies? A lot of people have allergies or, 
you know, they just don't want to live in a shelter where there are pet owners um, or they're afraid of animals. All of this is addressed in the manual. And even objections from staff or other residents, I talk about how you can talk to them to help them understand that animal abuse links to domestic violence. This is a solution to get the family out and get them to safety. Now, one question um, that, I've, that I've actually gotten uh, pretty recently is, can an abuser track a pet and track it to a domestic violence shelter? They are coming out with GPS tracking devices that are um, either tabs that you put on a pet collar or they're embedded in a pet collar. So I always recommend that when pets come into shelter, take the collars and throw them away. They don't need them. Um, to my knowledge, and it's not to say this isn't coming, um, but microchips in pets are not GPS tracking devices. They, they have to be scanned and then it just literally comes back to the name and phone number of the owner. It doesn't give a location. But when it comes to collars, I would always recommend taking the collar off and throwing it away because you just don't know. But all the concerns that you can possibly think of, um, th I, this is why I'm on the third edition of the manual because I work with shelters all the time. I take their concerns, I take their questions and I put it in the manual and I keep it updated so that you can go through it. I also go into legal issues, you know, confidentiality issues, you know, if the pet has to go to the veterinary clinic, you know, look at your confidentiality laws and the pet should be included, even if they are off site. You're going to want to ask your client if they have any sort of court order involving the pet that is on site, or do they have a pet protection order? Colorado has a pet protection order law. You want to know if there's any custody or ownership issues. Um, so I talk about all of that in the manual, as well as insurance for this. Many insurance companies don't charge extra, or if, if it is extra, it's a very minimal amount. Because if you say that you have reviewed the safety manual, you have created your program on the foundation of the safety program, you're, you have an animal shelter partner, you have a veterinary partner, and the family is taking care of their own pets. Nobody else is touching those animals. That's really all the insurance carrier wants to hear. They just want to make sure that there's not going to be any animals running around loose, potentially harming other people. So I talk about that, as well as whether you need a special kennel license or a special permit. That is all jurisdictional but your animal shelter partner is gonna have that answer for you. All right, and then the financial preparation phase. Money is never an issue. I am stunned at the generosity of grants that are out there, of, of how donors are stepping up. But some things that you really wanna consider is you know, money for your setup, you're going to want some basic supplies on hand because if somebody comes into shelter, they may not have dog food or pet food or a litter box. Um, you know, do you need an outdoor area for dogs to run and play and, you know, exercise? If so, do you need security cameras? If you're doing an outdoor kennel, do you need a security camera? Do you want a little slush fund for veterinary care in case if a dog comes in with a broken leg? And I'm not aware of any shelter that is charging for housing pets, but you can certainly do whatever you want. Um, and you can decide how long the pets get to stay. And then of course, I, you know, you need to find out if you have to pay an extra fee for insurance. But fundraising is easy with this program because all it requires is public awareness and coordinating with your animal shelter partner for fundraisers. When people hear about this program coming into their community, they love it. They want to donate food. They want to donate money. They want to donate, you know, dog leashes and cat toys and pet beds. And so going back to this photo, this is the shelter here in Saginaw, Michigan. And they took basically a junk room that was full of stuff that they didn't need. And they turned it into a pet pantry because they were getting so much food. <laughs> so that's a good problem to have. And this photo on the right is from the Naples, Florida shelter. 
and uh, they were taking that around their community. And the children in shelter made these butterflies and put requests on it. Where, so people, you know, customers at a, at a store could take one of the butterflies and it asked for a bag of cat litter. And so they knew to go get a bag of cat litter and leave it at a donation drop spot. And then the photo on the left, these are donor plaques at Harbor House in Orlando, Florida, because people love to memorialize their pets and businesses love to be recognized. So this is a really great way to raise money. Um, the shelter in Hermitage, Pennsylvania, they just got out into their community. You know, they were talking to Rotary Club, Zonta Club, Kiwanis Club, going into civic organizations, going into schools and hospitals, um, doing all sorts of, you know, requests for pet beds and animal toys and dishes and getting food donated and and it worked. I mean, they really got stocked with a lot of supplies. But what I love are all the private funding options that are available. These are all on the safety program website. I keep it updated. So just make sure that you save the safety program website in your computer so that you can go back and look when you're ready to go and fundraise um, because there's a lot of grants. Um, uh, Red Rover just gave out four grants to four shelters and the grant amounts were pretty high. I was seeing them in about the $30,000 range. So it depends on what you're building and what you need, but there's a lot of opportunities. I just learned that um, you guys had a new law enacted that is putting money into your crime victims fund, including money for domestic violence and sexual assault services. Now, there is some language about attending to the needs of animal companions. So I, you know, I haven't seen the specs for this. I don't know what um, the, the grant language is requiring for a proposal, but boy, be on the lookout for that because that is amazing. That is Colorado specific money for you. And if you can use this to, to build your, your pet housing program, go for it. Absolutely go for it. And the, fed, the feds have been coming up with money. They are on their second round of awarding money under the PAWS Act. So in October, 2020, they handed out $2.2 million and it was only to six agencies. You know, I, I'm on the federal coalition for this. And, you know, my um, uh, feedback was that $2.2 million could have helped 200 shelters. <laughs> it could have helped a lot of shelters with just $20,000. So um, they're, they've expanded it more. They're offering $3 million this year. They're currently in review of the applications and more shelters are going to get money. So we're hoping in 2024 that there's going to be another round of money. So stay tuned, stay tuned for that. But I love it that, that the federal government now has money available specifically for, for on-site pet housing programs. And then another phase that you wanna think about is the welcoming phase. You know, okay, you're up and running, what do you do? So in the manual, I give you all sorts of uh, sample forms and assessments, Word documents that you can download. Uh, you'll have access to other shelters, policies and procedures. So you're gonna have all these forms that you can tweak and you can adjust to your shelter so that you can use them. I like to make it easy because it really is the foundation of the safety program. I wanna make it easy so that it will be implemented. And you know, I go through about having pet supplies, how the family cares for the pets. What do you do if a family comes in and they don't, they've never been taught to clean a litter box every day, to walk their dog. You know, this is where you can bring in your animal shelter partner about learning how to care for pets, doing pet enrichment if you have a kennel on site. You know, how do you make sure that the pets are gonna be safe and secure, that nobody is gonna break in and try to steal them out of, you know, an outdoor kennel. Um, I, I talk about what if a pet is abandoned and address that even on one of the intake forms that if one of your clients leaves and they leave their pet behind, that pet is all automatically 
surrendered and goes to your animal shelter partner for adoption. So all of these things have been thought about um, and are in the manual to really help you go through all of this. And so when I look at Colorado, you are one of the superstars in, in this country. I mean, look at how many, you have nine shelters that I'm aware of. I don't know if there are more that have come on board, but this is amazing. You know, Aurora has outdoor housing, plus a couple of rooms inside. In Avon, they have pets in the room. And they, um, last I heard from them, they are building an indoor and outdoor kennel. Um, in Bailey, they have a cat cabin on the property as well as four large, four large dog runs in a heated garage. Um, in uh, East Lake, they put pets in the room. Um, Fort Collins, you're gonna see a photo of Fort Collins where they, they have space in the basement as well as an outdoor area. You know, Frisco have been putting them in the rooms. Um, so there's some great examples in Colorado for you to reach out if, and talk to them and ask them, you know, hey, what, what, what is working for you? You know, what issues have you had to deal with? So I want to go through now and um, in our final time here and show you what the shelters are doing. So housing option number one is where you put the pets in the room. So you can literally make a decision right now if you are in charge of your shelter or maybe imagine for a day I'm in charge and everything goes great. <laughs> I get to be the boss. You can set up this option with simply a decision. We're gonna do it. It doesn't cost any money and it is the greatest comfort for your client. Now, when you're dealing with allergies and fear of pets, this is controllable, and let me show you why. This is the shelter in Amsterdam, in the Netherlands. Why I love it for allergies, if you look at the photo on the left, hard floors. Hard floors are easy to clean up because allergies come from pet dander, not pet hair, from pet dander. So pet dander is really easy to clean up in a hard surface. I do have shelters that have carpet and they don't have a problem because they shampoo the carpets in between. The middle photo shows a radiator. So this means that forced air is not going in between the rooms. So again, this is great for containing pet dander. But if you do have central heating and cooling, all you need is to go to the hardware store and get a filter that you can cut and you put it in the cold air return and that will trap pet dander from going into another room. And then mattresses, I'm pretty sure that all shelters encase mattresses in a zippered cover for bed bug reasons. Well, it also helps to eliminate pet dander. So there's all of these little things to help with allergies. You could even get an air purifier in the room or have pet only rooms and other rooms are off limits to pets. So this is where I love to brainstorm with shelters because I, you come up with, with an issue, I will brainstorm with you a solution. In uh, Victorville, California, they have a couple of pet friendly rooms. And what they did was they busted through their cement walls and made these little pet doors and then put screened in areas on um, the sides. So they literally go from the apartment out to have fresh air, get a little bit of exercise and it's safe and it's secure because nobody's getting through that chain link fence to harm an animal or, you know, even potentially be bitten. It's not going to happen. So it's a very secure setup. In Caldwell, Idaho, you know, they, you, again, you can see in the photo, they have a hardwood floor that really helps with cleanup. And so they'll take any animal that can go into a room and they, they've been doing this for years and have not had any issues. And this, I actually got this testimonial um, from Bright Futures in Avon. And I love this because they, they implemented recently. And, um, you know, I've had some great conversations with them. And so I love this, you know, the partnerships that they created and the first time that they took in a pet and were able to reunite the pet with the, with the kids that were in shelter. So, this is why I love doing this because 
that family is forever changed because they got to safety with their pet and they're less likely to go back into the abusive home. Now, shelter option number two may cost a little bit of money and it can be just a couple of hundred dollars or it depends on if you can go out and ask for some free items. Setup could literally be done in a day and there is some comfort for the family because they're still in the shelter. They just may have to go down the hall to an indoor kennel. And so this is a great way to control allergies. <laughs> As my cat Stella crawls in my lap, I am literally surrounded by cats. <laughs> so um, this is another way of controlling allergies just a little bit more. All right, so the Sojourner Shelter in Phoenix, Arizona, um, they have um, their own little indoor kennel where they have um, cat kennels, small pet kennels, they have dog kennels, and then they have an area where people can go and just sit with their pet and it's all contained. And um, here in, um, I had to get Stella out of my lap, <laughs> um, in, uh, in Canada, the Interval House, um, they built this beautiful space, absolutely beautiful. Um, uh, they opened in July of 2018. Uh, they have partnered, you know, with their local vet clinic and, um, and they built this to have their own separate heating and air conditioning system. Um, they have a kitchen where they prep food and they can do laundry, but then they have this area with a television and Wi-Fi where people can just go and sit with their pets. So I love that. And that was all funded with grants. Um, Mountain Peace in, in Bailey. Um, I love what they did. Um, and I don't know if they've expanded this, but they started way back in 20, 2006. And so small pets like cats, um, rabbits, birds, um, they, they took their garage and they split it. They split it. So one half is for pets and, you know, that are small, like cats and birds. And the other side is for dogs. And I love it. I, it's, it's just such a great concept of taking a garage because technically a garage is still considered an indoor kennel. Uh, Fort Walton Beach, Florida, they took a room that was just being filled with a lot of junk. And they said, we don't need all of this stuff. Let's clean it out. Let's put cat or dog, cat or dog kennels in it. And so they created an indoor kennel with this spare room. Naples, Florida took a utility room and put six large dog crates in it. And, it, and it's worked for them. And they are a very, very large shelter. So they just found that this simplistic model worked great. And then through that outside door goes to this grassy area for people to sit with their pets. And I love visiting these shelters um, and seeing what they've done because simple always wins. It always wins. Um, Sarasota, Florida, they took their basement. You can see these are work cubicles, but they took their basement and they used those cubicles as wall separators for pets. So, you know, cause pets of other families may not like seeing another pet. So that's what they did and it's working wonderful for them. Uh, here in Michigan and Howell, they have two separate areas. Um, they, they have an indoor kennel with, with cages that look very much like a veterinary clinic. And that's the photo on the left. And then the photo on the right, they took another room and put cages in it for larger animals, for larger dogs. They also have an outdoor area. They also have a therapy dog that comes in for the kids who get really upset that there are pets on the property, but they can't touch them. So, um, so they have Penny who comes in and she does therapy work with the kids. Um, in Saginaw, Michigan, the Underground Railroad took some space in the basement. They created some dog kennels. You can see on the, on the right here, there's a little doggy door that then goes to the outdoor area that you see here on the left. Families First in North Carolina kept it super simple. They took a room and they just put some, some cages in them and some crates in them and they just keep it really simple. If there's just one family with pets, the pets are allowed to free roam in this small room. 
So it doesn't have to be luxurious. Pets just want to be with their people and they just want to be safe and fed. <laughs> All right, housing option number three. Now this could cost potentially thousands of dollars and it can take several months and several years to set it up depending on the complexity. It is the least amount of comfort for your client because they will have to physically go outside the shelter to see their pet. But if, if you have a stumbling block with allergies and I'm not able to help you get beyond that block, then you have eliminated the issue with allergies or fear of pets by other residents. So let me show you what they're doing. So one thing that I love is when a shelter sends me a photo like what you see here on the top and they think, we don't have room. We, we don't have room, we just can't do this. I can see the room that's available and what you see on the bottom is what they actually did. So um, sometimes you need an objective viewpoint and that's what I love to offer. I have yet to walk through a shelter or see videos and photos that I can't find a place to put animals. I can always find a place. So um, for some shelters, it might be a little maddening because it's like, I even had a shelter recently say, Allie, for every reason I give you, you come up with five reasons why we should. It's kind of maddening. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I, I'm solution driven. It, it's, it's why I was a prosecutor. I could think on my feet. So I'm going to help you find a solution. So if you want help, I will take a space like that and help you transform it. Um, look at what Crossroads um, did. So they have um, a space in the basement as well as an outdoor kennel. And again, it doesn't have to be extravagant. It just has to be safe. You know, especially in Colorado, you're going to need outdoor heating and cooling. And, you know, you just need to make sure it's secure. Um, Broward County, Florida, um, they built a really nice facility on the property. So, you know, the money was there and they were able to get it in a grant, you know, but again, you can also reach out to an organization called Greater Good. They will come in and they will build it for you. They're not going to give you money, but they will give you manpower and they will build it for you, including all the supplies. So reach out and ask because they love doing this. Um, Harbor House in Orlando, they built a huge facility because they are in a large jurisdiction. So they have you know, a beautiful space for the small animals that you see on the left. On the right are the dog kennels. And in the middle, they have these screened, screened in porches where they can go and just be with their pet. Rosebrook Shelter had um, an incident make the national news. And the dog that you see on the right, his name was Hank. Now he, he survived, okay? He survived, but him and his mom were being beaten with a hammer. And if that wasn't enough, the abuser then threw them out a second story window. And so she had enough strength to drag her and Hank to the Rosebrook Shelter. And at the time they weren't housing pets. Um, but they were defiant and said, we're coming in, you know, this, this has happened to us. And so that really transformed the thinking of the Rosebrook staff. And so they ended up building in, on their property, they built this shelter and they dedicated it to Hank and his bravery. And you can see even the photo on the left, there are cats in those cages. They've been full. There was such a need in the community and the photo on the right, Again, it's not luxurious, but it doesn't need to be. Put a couch in there, you got the dog kennels, let the dogs out. All the dogs are gonna to wanna to do is sit in their lap, you know, maybe watch a little television. So they served a need for their community because of what happened to Hank and his mom. Um, in Las Vegas, they have a huge jurisdiction. So they went through a multi-year, multi-million dollar capital campaign to build the Noah's house. And they're full most of the time. It's a beautiful facility. That's what they needed in that jurisdiction. And they had an amazing advocate by the name of Stacy Colombo who did it. She went in there and said, I will do this for you. And then now they're doing the same thing in Reno, Nevada, because these are big jurisdictions. So you can see that there's all sorts of models from multi-million dollar to really super simple, um, you know, this in Tulsa, Oklahoma opened about five years ago, 
And, you know, they built a little outdoor pet kennel and you can see the little pet rooms on the left. And then they have a screened in uh, play areas. So there's all sorts of options. This is what I love brainstorming with shelters with. And I will connect you directly with these shelters so that you can talk to them about what they did and, you know, the donations they got, the grants that they got, you know, because when you go out and you ask for free stuff, free labor, free supplies, you're going to be amazed at what, what will come to you. You know, this was a pre-engineered building um, specifically for dogs that has very, very strong um, um, kennel areas on there. So even the most aggressive chewer isn't going to get through. So I love this. And this story I really, really love because that cost that shelter no money because there was an Eagle Scout who had a badge that he needed to earn. And he built that for them. And then they got a grant from Petco for pet food. So they've, they've been able to operate with no money coming out of their operating funds. So as you can see, there's a lot of different options. And then um, for, I'm just checking my time here. How am I doing? Okay, I'm gonna wrap up soon. When it comes to transitional housing, you know, this is usually gonna be dependent on the private landlord that you're working with, unless you have your own place that you own and you're able to put somebody. But this is really important because if you bring a client and their pet into emergency housing, but you don't have the next stage available for them, the, it is a great likelihood that they're gonna go back into the abusive environment or they could experience homelessness. So what I like to help the shelters with is, you know, if you, if you don't have transitional housing, what can you do? You know, can you find pet friendly housing? Um, can, you, can you just keep a list of pet friendly um, landlords uh, that will rent? You know, I hear that there's lack of affordable housing. Um, and when you're dealing with rentals, you know, you've got to get the consent of the landlord and they may charge a huge amount of money for pet deposits. Um, but, you know, I'm hearing from some shelters that, you know, there's a, um, a shelter in Spruce Pine, North Carolina, where they're paying the pet deposit. They found pet friendly rentals and they are paying the pet deposit. You can fundraise for that. Put it out on Facebook. Hey, we have a family that's ready to go into transitional housing. We need a $500 pet deposit. Who wants to help, you know, Fido and Fluffy, you know, stay with their, stay with their mom or dad and get into pet friendly housing. People love that. People love donating through social media. Um, the Rosebrook shelter that I showed you in Kansas City, Missouri, they um, are able to pay um, the whole transitional housing rent for up to a year because of money that they're getting. Um, uh, there's a shelter in Athens, Ohio, where they help locate pet friendly housing and they provide pet supplies and assistance, even if it includes paying the pet deposit. Um, there is a shelter in Quincy, Illinois, and they don't have a transitional housing program, but they partner with pet friendly rentals and they're using their um, emergency solutions grant funding through HUD to pay up to three months of rent and utility costs. So, Allie, um, Allie, this is Brandy. I'm so sorry. I know you're giving us some great ideas and awesome tips. I just want to point out that we're at one o'clock and I want to make sure that we um, have appropriate translation for all of, of what we've been able to share. And I just wanted to make a note that if folks um, you know, if folks have questions for you, that we'll make sure that they get your contact information. Um, if they want, can reach out, would that be okay? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I wasn't sure since we started 10 minutes late if we were going 10 minutes over, but I, I understand if we need to cut this off now. Yeah, I apologize. Yes, sometimes the technical difficulties um, do get, get us, you know, do cut us off sometimes and I apologize. Yes. Um, I so just here, let me, um, yep, let me go. That's all my contact information. 
Yes, and so we will send out the recording links as well as these slides, which will have Ali's information on them. Um, and we'll also send out a link so that you can take a, a quick poll to give us some feedback about the today's webinar. And I really want to um, say thank you again, Ali, for sharing all of this. It sounds like your, your manual is going to be chock full of great resources so people can go ahead and, you know, go online to the safetyprogram.org and, and download that. And hopefully that's something helpful for all of you. And uh, thank you all for attending and we appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. Thank you. And also thank you to our interpreters, Marcy and Johnny. Thank you so much.